Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure as the publisher and founder of the syllabus to welcome you to this session, which is also new to us. We normally curate content uh, rather than produce it, but this topic seemed original and also important enough uh, to merit hosting a discussion like that with three wonderful thinkers. Um, me, I have a PhD in history of science from uh, Harvard University. I've been living in Italy for the last uh, few years. Uh, working on uh, the syllabus, which I think of as a knowledge curation platform. We're really trying to show that a different uh, logic can inform how we find, discover, and organize knowledge online, not just that of Twitter, Facebook, and Google. And the syllabus is striving to not just do that, but also stimulate some conversations about how to do it better. So I'll probably pass it on to Peter, and maybe the rest of our wonderful panel can also introduce themselves later on. Great. Well, thank you, Evgeny, uh, and thank you, uh, Peter and Emily, for joining. I thought that we would have a discussion today that would be, in a way, a complement to the careful curation of interesting sources that uh, Evgeny Morozov and his uh, colleagues have put together, assembled on their on their syllabus site. And so, what I thought I'd do is to begin with the fact that both of you have written these really interesting books within the last year or two. And uh, each of them addresses the problem of the history of the modern ed educational formation of the research institution, the research and teaching university in different ways um, from quite different angles, all different countries. Emily, yours through uh, cross comparison of the United States and and Germany and the exchanges between them, and um, and and Peter, uh, yours in tracking this ongoing tension uh, of the expansion of the university's remit in who it addressed, uh, and more generally the problem of uh, of expanding who went to universities and the corresponding tension between the impulses towards democratization and meritocracy. These are all themes that both of you have addressed that press us both to understand better how we came to be in the situation we're in now. And I thought we'd start by talking a little bit about your projects, the books, what surprised you in the understanding that you've developed in the course of these intensively researched projects. And then uh, in the second half of our discussion, uh, maybe from first 20, 20 minutes talking about your work and then 20 minutes reflecting on where we might go today or what are these what is understanding a history of the present in some sense in how does it inform how we might think about the future of the university um, I'll ask you I mean my sense is that we are at a at a decisive point in the history of universities right now universities are asking what their purposes are the cultures and societies in which they're in installed or asking what what good they are and who's good they are and what they should be. So that, that was the goal is to spend 20 minutes talking about mm -hmm. your projects and go back and forth, um, uh, give you a chance to start Emily and then um, Peter and I may have some questions. Uh, and then the same with Peter Mandler and uh, and then we'll turn towards looking at where that might leave us looking forward. What are What is the situation of our university today? So Emily, let me start with you and pursuing this question that I, that I mentioned, which is, I mean, every, you know, in the university, it's a fairly well understood feature of UK and, and North American universities that they drew tremendously from Germany uh, in the last third of the 19th century. But there are aspects of the story that you tell that are surprising in how that led to a back and forth, not just an importation of goods, so to speak. Uh, can you tell a little bit about um, what surprised you in the course of working? What is the th what what? How did your thesis change as you dug deeper into these materials? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Evgeny, for this introduction and Peter Gallison for uh, including me in this important conversation about the past and future of the university and on this very innovative platform, the syllabus. I'm excited to be here. And I assume you'll tell me if you can't hear me okay, 
Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, by way of sort of introduction, I thought since Evgeny suggested we introduce ourselves, I'll just say sort of first that um, I, I have a PhD in history, um, in German and European intellectual history um, from Stanford. And, and before coming to Stanford's Graduate School of Education, where I'm currently associate professor, I taught history for 10 years at the University of North Carolina. And I, I'm still an intellectual historian, though I now write about higher education. And I approach this question as an intellectual historian. And intellectual historians sometimes talk about two different ways of thinking about ideas and intellectuals. On the one hand, textualist or um, ideas to the exclusion of the world, or contextualism, ideas as explained by the world. And I think that debate is important here because oftentimes we hear, I think, a characterization of the university as being a sort of reflection of the zeitgeist. You know, today we, we, we have the neoliberal university, or, and yesterday we had the Cold War university. Or, on the other hand, we hear description of the university as being separate and apart from the world, um, sort of as it's always been. And I think both of these positions are reductive, and they don't get at that sort of dynamic, vo volatile change and exchange that you alluded to, uh, Peter. So in my forthcoming book, Allies and Rivals, in which I present a, um, a, a new kind of take on the emergence, the origins and emergence of the modern research university, I offer three frameworks that I think might be helpful for our conversation. I think it gets at what you were asking me about how I sort of invert the, the, the traditional story about the importation of, of German goods to America. Um, the first framework is what I would call the academic uh, social contract. And it describes the relationship between the university um, and the outside world. And, here I say that the university is neither just in the world of ideals, nor is it just in the world of politics and economics, but rather we need to think about, in particular, the modern research university. Um, of course, there's precedents, and we may talk about those, but I'm talking about the, the modern research university that emerges in Berlin in 1810 as being more contractual or transactional than normally um, uh, considered. Uh, that it was given an unprecedented amount of autonomy to stand apart from society in exchange for services uh, rendered to that society. And, and so I argue that one of the most important levers of change are academic innovators who create this contracted space um, and iterate on different versions of the institution, negotiating with different partners, whether it be a nation state or states uh, or philanthropist founders or other institutions. And then the second framework that gets more to, I think, this question of, of exchange is describes the relationship among universities themselves. Um, and this is what amounted to what I call competitive emulation. Um, this was a value system that was separate and, um, from economics and, and, and nation states. And it was a value system of open exchange and mutual uh, validation. So it's, it's hard to imagine kind of rival corporations or rival states sh sh sharing state secrets or, sh or, st or sharing uh, military secrets, but that's exa exactly the value system, I would argue, that operates among intellectual reformers like those Germans and Americans who went back and forth over the course of 100 years, um, in which they recognize that you have to cooperate even with your fiercest uh, competitors in order for ideas to advance and for institutions to evolve. And I think this sort of prefigures perhaps some of the debates we have today about exclusionary nationalist scientific policies and more globalist uh, positions. And then finally, the thing, and maybe this gets to the sort of surprise factor too, the final framework I would offer for our um, consideration is, is what I would call the relationship between outsiders and ideas. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation today about the di diversification of, of um, you know, ideas, the diversification of these institutions. And one of the things I discovered um, somewhat accidentally over the course of, of my research is another important lever of change was that strategic uh, leaders of these institutions often used uh, previously untapped ideas or previously excluded individuals to give their new institutions a leg up. So one example of, of such a moment is when the founding president of the first modern research university, Johns Hopkins in America, Daniel Coit Gilman, um, takes advantage of the fact that this university will be non-denominational and hires a, a Jew, a British Jew, actually, James Joseph Sylvester, who can't um, kind of get a position in the Oxbridge world because he's not willing to renounce um, his Judaism. 
And so they bring this um, very talented mathematician over to seed this new uh, fledgling university in, in America. And there's other examples like this of the ways that um, mar previously marginalized individuals and ideas help to iterate and innovate um, institutions. So each of these different sort of axes, if you will, I think are required to understand this um, extremely complex institution um, over time. And, and each of these different, um, different stories emerged over the course of my research to help to build that picture. One thing that you talk about a lot in the book um, is this theme of competition. Competition mm -hmm. arises between the United States and Germany. Mm -hmm. Competition arises among mm -hmm. the various American uh, universities. Mm -hmm. uh, and these rivalries or these frenemies of the, mm -hmm. <laughs> these rival allies uh, that, 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 that develop over time uh, give are a motive force for you, but also an explanation for why certain things don't happen. For instance, why the mm -hmm. dominant French universities of the 18th century right. uh, are eclipsed uh, by Germany in the 19th century. So can you say a little bit about the way uh, rivalry functions uh, yeah. in your historiographical scheme? I mean, is that as a form of, as an explan explanatory form for you? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that that question. I think I think it's important because I think it points to the ways that internalist explanations of ideas are not, are simply not enough to explain origins, emergence, and and success. Because as as others m might point out, um, the French system is different, but not all that different from Germany. They also start to modernize their system at the end of the 19th century, and they also start to integrate what we would call research or the advancement of knowledge and and teaching the dissemination of knowledge, um, which, you know, the, the Germans and the French play up the differences. But I think actually these external organizational structures are as important in explaining success. So I spend a lot of time looking, for example, at what has been called federalism um, in Germany and America, the sort of intense political debates about how we organize power um, um, centrally or decentrally? Is it devolved or is it organized um, um, in, one, in one place? And I try to expand that conversation to thinking about a culture, um, um, research, um, and science as well, as my actors were themselves debating this at the end of the 19th century. Should there be one national university on which we lavish all the funds and, and use that as and have that be, has a synecdotic relationship to our nation and projects power into the world and sort of moves us forward? Or shall, shall we devolve, you know, this, um, the research um, across different states or in other kind of organization? And here I draw heavily on the sociology of knowledge and the important work of Yosef Ben David, um, who wrote a series of important articles about decentralization and centralization in the in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and, and sort of try to apply that sociology of knowledge in some ways to the political history to show how Germany and America were, were very much thinking about this organization about in the same time in the middle and then in the last quarter of the of the 19th century. And I think one of the conclusions, and of course it's hard to control for certain factors is that it was that federalism was clearly one of the conditions for the possibility, I think, of excellence. Um, in, and, and, it, and, it, and it is, I think, part of how it's explained, and perhaps Peter Mandler has something also more to say about this, about the British case, is that it, 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 didn't, it didn't exist in the same way um, in, in Great Britain or, or in France. Uh, thank you, Emily. That, that's really great. And it does lead uh, naturally to questions, some questions I had for, for Peter, for Peter sure. Mandler. Um, you know, I mean, there are many things to talk about in the, in this book, Peter, that, uh, that strike me. Um, I think the one that's been commented on by most people is something worth talking about, which is your shift from history from above towards the demand drive from students are more particularly from their parents and more particularly from the mothers of children than they wanted to see them advance in, 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 in life at various crucial shifting points in British education and that drove this expansion of who should go to 
who should get more education? What kind of education should it be? How far in the system should they be advanced? Uh, but another is um, methodological. And I, I was very struck in the way you conduct the work that you not only draw from sociology, economics, um, political science, and, and, and the history, uh, the intellectual history of the university, but you're interested in the, the history of those fields themselves as they explore this, reanalyzing data, looking at their surveys and seeing how they can be re-understood in a contemporary light and so on. So, but let's begin with... Um, uh, with with with, could you introduce us to the problem that you're interested yeah. in and this uh, what you call in the book, but it's a renaming of things under other names of democracy uh, and meritocracy. Those weren't the original terms for them, but these are contested themes for you throughout the book. Yeah, um, I'm, uh, thanks, uh, Peter. I might just um, before I answer your questions, I might just say w uh, one point. Uh, at one point um, uh, um, about Emily's book, um, and I'm really one of the reasons I'm delighted to be part of this conversation is I got a sneak peek at uh, at Emily's book <laughs> in advance of publication and have had a chance to absorb it. Um, but I think that this it's something very interesting about um, doing comparative history in the present moment, um, which is that you know we used to think very much, especially about 19th century European history, mm -hmm. in national silos because mm -hmm. our um, our historiographical traditions were heavily yoked to our national educational systems and to our states. And even comparative history, I mean, as late as the 70s when I was training, it was, it was you know, comparing one silo to another, whereas um, um, partly because of globalization, but partly also because of um, greater awareness of the commonalities between uh, similar and contiguous um, systems, um, there's been a, a trend towards writing um, histoire croise, entangled histories, showing how mm -hmm. um, these national traditions never grow up independent of each other. They're always pairing each other. And one of the things that really struck me reading Emily's book, and I also have seen it in other spheres, is where you have these European systems or Europe, Anglo um, European, I mean, sorry, um, Atlantic systems um, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, which are actually quite similar in many respects, have similar states and similar. Um, uh, democracies and similar cultures, if you compare them to China or Russia, again, that's where, how globalization has made us look at this differently. They look actually more similar than different. And if you bring them into juxtaposition, as Emily does, you see them always saying, oh, the other guy does it better. You know, in France, they say the Americans do it better. In America, they say the Germans do it better. And in Brit Germany, they say the, the Brits do it better. And that may has, in, in, in the old mode, used to, meant that we used to assume, oh, well, they're different systems because they're always saying that someone else is different from them. But in fact, th this is a rhetorical device, isn't it? In which you uh, uh, actually create convergence. You know, the French become more like the Germans, the Germans become more like the Americans, the Americans become more like the Brits, because they're constantly comparing each other and trying to absorb the best um, features of their system. So I think that's really beautifully brought out in, in Emily's book. And as I say, I think it's very much of the early 21st century. I mean, we. We're not looking at, at these histories in such um, nationally segregated terms. Um, my own um, work, I mean, I, I'm principally a British historian. I mean, I have written about both British and American universities and um, intellectual life, but I'm principally a British historian. And I um, only started writing about education relatively recently. Uh, and it came about because of, of my engagement with the state. That is, I was um, um, an officer, ultimately president of the Royal Historical Society, the principal learned society for historians in Britain. And um, we, you know, we, we spent a lot of time engaging with the state, which nominally regulated and even to some extent controlled the whole university system. And so I thought, well, I, should, I better learn about the history of the relationship between the universities and the state. And so I started doing um, historical research in this area that really went alongside my representative work for the Royal Historical Society. But what I discovered is, as you were um, suggesting um, in your introduction, is that um, it's a story that's where the state plays a role, but it's not necessarily got the whip hand. It's not necessarily its own fantasies of control, um, which historians have tended to take too seriously, um, because we've always feel most comfortable in state records and you know, 
for a long time we were handmaidens of the state ourselves, we tended to take these fantasies of control too seriously. And what I discovered when I began to work on my book, which is called The Crisis of the Meritocracy, Britain's Transition to Mass Education Since the Second World War, is that um, you can't really understand any educational system without uh, seeing that it's a, it's, it's a massively distributed system, which even really powerful states have only limited um, um, power to control whatever they say. Um, and I mean, you know, ed education, if you, if you think about it, is one of the most intrusive things that states attempt upon their citizenry. I mean, we all, again, 19th century European historians are always going on about things like nationalizing the railways and the post office and, um, and you know, conscription, mass conscription. But, you know, education, the states attempt to seize, you know, five, 10, 15 years of every citizen's life. and um, molded in the uh, in direction that the state um, desires, at least that's the aspiration. But by the same token, because it is such a um, massively distributed enterprise, um, it's the, the ability, of, as I said, of even very strong states to actually do what they imagine that they're doing is, is limited. And so therefore, if you look at the history of educational systems, you have to look at family, community, um, region, um, and, and you have to look at change in values, what people want from education, how they use the system to their own benefit. I mean, it seems like a banal point to most historians that you have to look at things bottom up as well as top down, but it's amazing how little um, historians of education, at least in the UK, have done this. And the people who have done it um, um, most have been sociologists and economists, which, um, uh, as you say, um, occupies a, a large part of my um, and their work is, is, has occupied a large part of, of my research. Uh, but of course, they, always, they do it also from their very distinctive disciplinary perspectives. You know, sociologists think of an educational system is for the reprodu re reproduction of the social order. And economists think that an educational system is for um, the investment in human capital for economic growth. Um, and you might say that, you know, any other discipline would attribute that, you know, project their own fantasies onto educational systems as well. So. I mean, I know historians like to say this, but I think it's really true. We have to be the queen of the disciplines. We have to borrow something from all the disciplines because we're looking mm -hmm. at how all the different aspects of human behavior integrate, and we're not willing to confine ourselves to sociology or economics or um, or or the role of the state. Mm -hmm. So I try to tell a story about the growth of of education, and it's it's not just higher education because those. The, the decisions um, and aspirations that people have for their education begin when they're young. Um, so it's it's about secondary as well as uh, secondary schooling as well as higher education. My my story is really as much about what people want from the state um, as um, what the state wants from them. I don't know if you're muted or. Sorry, I had muted myself. Um, I think thinking about the two books and the wider literature that's grown up around the current state of the university, I'm put in mind of the inscription on the side of your car mirror that says objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Uh, I, you know, in a way, the university is a 13th century invention, but in a way it's incredibly recent in mm -hmm. many of the features that we most value. And uh, Emily, you uh, rightly talk about the early 19th century origins of the research university, but the research university that you would recognize if you landed in the middle of it uh, is a much more recent phenomenon as, as, as you show. And I wonder whether do you see our contemporary discussions about, uh, I mean, I know your book is not about the contemporary moment particularly, but it's it's reflecting in some ways on the conditions that make the contemporary possible. Do you see our moment as, uh, as one where the research university, research and teaching university is itself uh, under a new kind of pressure? Or do you see it as essentially that we're in a period of continuity across a, post-war period? Do you see a period that goes from 1945 to 1975-80, or do you see, uh, are we in a 
in something of a more inflectional point. Is that, would you like As me to answer to that you, first? Emily, yes. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you wanted Peter to go first. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that all historians have to decide when to begin their story. And like you said, we can have our antecedents could go back to Bologna. They could go to the Enlightened Manera with Halle in 1694 or Göttingen in 1737. And I think there's new research that shows that a lot of the innovations around promoting research and the sem what we call the seminar, the historical criticism, you know, begin in Halle. They be begin in Göttingen with the emphasis on, um, on freedom of inquiry. Um, before we get to uh, Berlin. But I think that what is unique about the modern research university, if we might call it an ideal type in the Weberian sort of style, is this, this contract with the state that also Peter Mandler was talking about it. And the way that Humboldt, as it's, you know, Wilhelm von Humboldt, as it's, um, as the sort of or modern research university founder, um, becomes rather skillful at sort of marshalling these, these arguments for usefulness of this new institution that combines research and teaching for the purpose of the state. And that is, for me, that's why we begin, we begin our, our current origin story there. So when you ask, are we at sort of a new moment, um, you know, I, I don't see the post-45 moment as, as different. I see it as, 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 as exceptional, perhaps, in the amounts of money and the amounts of students. But that is a, that is a difference um, in degree and not in kind. And if the academic contract became unrecognizable, perhaps it's because intellectuals or scholars or scientists gave up too much. Um, in that transaction. And of course, there were people, as you know better than I, you know, who, who worried about that at the time, you know, MIT is just a, a, a national, a lab, a lab with a sort of, you know, um, um, a, a learning appended and, and various kinds of caricatures like, like this. And so, so I think that what you see, if you take the long durée view is that um, be beginning with this founding moment, we're going to bring research and teaching together in one unit, we very quickly find that, um, that it's difficult to deliver on either teaching and learning or on research um, when the expectation is that they are to be get together in one bundle, to use the Silicon Valley term. And so, um, you know, in different moments, we get the creation of new institutions that are devoted to just one or the other. So you can see that, you know, in the 1920s, there's sort of a revival of the liberal arts colleges um, that want to eschew the university and research altogether and just go back to kind of you know, Socratic dialogue with students around the table, um, you know, working the land and living in communities together. And there's countless examples of these from Black Mountain to Reed College to Bennington and so forth. Um, and in other moments, we have, you know, Abraham Flexner, um, Peter Mandler and I were just talking about Flexner, who, who sort of exasperated by the American Research University not reaching its heights, basically says, we're not going to deal with learning. And we don't want undergraduates. We're just going to create kind of what the German university was supposed to be. And by, by this, of course, he meant the Institute for Advanced Study in 1933 and just bring the, the, the brightest researchers together to, to make America the most powerful force for science. So I see today as a sort of continuity of that. And the kind of offshoots that you see, whether it's boot camps for coding or MOOCs, are various attempts to, I think, take up, um, um, say, the say the task of, of teaching or the, or the project of, 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 of imparting skills better than is, or more efficiently that is happening in that bundle. And I think what will happen is very much what happened in the past is that, you know, hybridizations will occur and the best of these institutional innovations um, will be combinations or mashups of, or sub some kind or the other of the university that managed to incorporate some of those opposing ideas into new formulations. Most of them will fail, but some of them will survive, just like Johns Hopkins did in 1876 when it took the liberal arts college and merged it with the um, German research university and created the American version of the modern research university, um, which was itself an entrepreneurial startup that turned out to be tremendously um, successful. So it's interesting. I mean, there's a, I, I, I want to turn to you in a moment, Peter. Um, but there, there are two impulses that pull in opposite directions. I think in a way, 
your intellectual historical hat sees immense continuity uh, in the current university uh, bundling together. But then as you dig in another layer down from that, you also see um, that this is a period, what you call a mashup, in which there are other models that are being put forward. Uh, now, Peter, um, you know, in a way, there's much that's in common between the two projects. Uh, but Emily, as she says, does come, I mean, she's much more than a straight up intellectual historian, because she's interested in these various embeddings in the wider world. Uh, and you're doing something much more than social history. But there is part of your impulse to look at um, at massification, at scale, yeah. leading to qualitative changes. So I uh, have the strong impression from your book, that you do see a break, uh, that's something that happens in 45 to 75, and that the scope, you know, I mean, even when I was in Europe and École Polytechnique in the 1970s as a student, 6% of French 18-year-olds went to college, and that was pretty common across Europe. And now it's 40, 50, 51% in many countries. Uh, that's a huge change in scope and scale that leads yeah. to a change in the sort of mission and self-sensibility, so to speak, of what a university is or is for. So I wanted to ask you a, a, a similar question, which is to the one I asked Emily, which is how do you see um, the continuities and breaks? Are we at a an unstable point uh, I don't adore the expression inflection point. It's overused and under understood. But uh, at, at the at the moment, are we at a point where we you can see different paths that might issue from where we are? Yeah, I, I, you put your finger on uh, I think a difference of approach between Emily and me, which leads me to a somewhat different answer um, to the to the same question. Um, uh, I mean, first of all, I think in certain ways, both Emily and my story are Whig stories, um, you know, bigger and better. Um, and as Emily says, it, you know, you can project this over a much longer time frame than just the post-war, which is the one that in which we're ex encouraged to think about bigger and better. But that starts, you know, in the mid, well, probably starts in the early 19th century, and then and then it goes through periods of acceleration in the end of the 19th century and, and after the Second World War. Um, uh, and some of this arises because of competitive emulation, as, as Emily uh, put it, and the, the process that we both referred to, where universities are comparing themselves, states are comparing themselves, and they're always trying to, um, universities are trying to encourage their states or their funders, whoever they may be, to, to want to be as good as the next guy. Um, and that that leads to a kind of sort of path dependent um, Whig trajectory. Um, but uh, I, I, do, I, and, and you know, historians are notoriously bad at uh, uh, predicting the future. But <laughs> um, I do think that we may be at a moment where some of the traject, the long-term trajectories that both Emily and I um, chart, may be coming to a close. I mean, the 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 element that you um, singled out, which is the sort of central thread of my book, which is about participation. I mean, that is obviously a, a, a story of, of, of onwards and upwards continuously from, um, you know, the 19th century um, to the present. And in fact, there's been an acceleration very recently, uh, but, um, you know, in historical times, um, um, there's been an acceleration so that, you know, people, we still in some ways think that the big burst of higher education growth was the 1960s. But in fact, in uh, and that was true to some extent in America, but of course, um, in Europe, the, the levels of participation in, were still relatively low in the 1960s, I and mean, they were a lot higher than they'd been in the 50s, but they were still relatively low. I mean, 5, 10, at most 15% of the 18 and 19 year olds going to university. The, the real acceleration came at the end of the 20th century when almost all, uh, not just European countries, but almost all developed countries uh, headed towards or past the 50% mark. Um, South Korea is now at over 70%. Uh, uh, young people's participation in higher education, Singapore similarly. Um, so it looks like we're in one of those, you know, that we have this long wig story of onwards and upwards, um, and that it's it's accelerated recently, and therefore, you know, we may be bursting forward into a glorious 21st century utopia of higher education. But but the last 10 or 15 years, uh, we see something very different, and 
Um, most, I mean, I have a chart, which if, if we were doing this kind of thing, I would share with you, um, which shows the participation mm -hmm. rate of, you know, almost all of the big developed economies, including China, Korea, and Japan, um, showing their participation rates across the 20th century. They're all going up, always going up. Um, and we don't, haven't seen any of them go down yet. But I, don't, I think you'd be very foolish if you predicted or put a lot of money on the bet that they would continue to go up. They might. I mean, as I say, Korea is pointing the way. China is still on the way up, but it has a long way to go to catch up with participation rates in the West. But um, I, am, am I so confident the participation rates are going to continue to rise in the US or the UK or France and Germany? I am not so confident. And you know, a number of things have hit in the last 15 years, one of which is the um, stagnation of um, incomes for the mass of the population. Um, and a, another is the, um, the, the latest of a series of crises of the humanities. I mean, they come every 10 or 20 years, and usually they're bogus because they're usually just a little wobble but you know like the boy who cried wolf um sometime a crisis of humanities may come and we may be in it right now where you know the world comes and gobbles the, the little boy and um if you look at the enrollment rates in humanities courses in, in both sides of the atlantic they are dropping pretty steadily now for 10 or 15 years um and whether states are are going to be willing to um Especially with populist governments, be willing to invest more and more in higher education as they were across the 20th century. Again, you'd be very foolish to put a lot of money on that bet. So I think we may be at a turning point, but you know, it's just it's all equally possible that we may be headed for Korea. It's interesting, you know, the politics of populism, which exists in various different forms, given their different historical circumstances and political circumstances in different countries does have an effect of, one hears now things that I had never heard before, certainly in the United States. I spent a semester in North Carolina and uh, uh, I people would say, we don't like the University of North Carolina because it turns our Republican children into Democrats. And um, there is a kind of, I've, I've sat with people in airplanes where they said, you know, some traveling Business person would say, "I'm, you know, I'm against the idea of having more people go to universities. Uh, I think universities are not good for America." That wasn't something that was a partisan, political, populist part of conservative right. thought, right? I mean, it was as long as the Republican Party had some vestige of of its aristocratic roots, so to speak, uh, American elite roots, it was all for higher education. But that's that has begun to shift. And I so I think the the view of the university from the you know the outside is has begun to change. And the universities themselves in their own in, inside thought about what they're for, you know, has begun to take on things like job placement to kind of use in economics perspective rather than a sociological or historical one. Um, you have also an attempt to control history itself. I mean, the Texas legislature deciding what will and won't be taught as historical. So I, I think there are a lot of forces that are buffeting uh, the university now, not all from the outside, some from the inside, some from the demands, as Peter, you would not be surprised to, to you know, you, if you were writing, you would say, well, of course, the parents of children going to universities or young adults going to universities care about their future. Uh, it's not now so much the liberal professions of law and medicine, nor is it exactly finance. Maybe it's now more uh, computation or biotech, nanotech, uh, spheres, um, uh, you know, Silicon Valley and the and the area around where you're now living, Emily, is you know has its own expectations of what for universities sure. are for, and the universities, are, you know, try to deliver that to them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think for all those reasons, I I tend to think we are at a you know that these big forces are buffeting the universities. Not that the universities should try to be the way they were in 2000 or 1975, but they, they, they are at a point where these things are being much debated. I guess the only thing I would just add, oh, just, just to sort of 
yeah, nuance that I, I really appreciated both of your comments. And I think one thing that Peter Mandler's work and my work share is this emphasis on individuals, right? And, and I think this to me is a really important point, which is that these structures, yes, that you point out, Peter Gallison, are there and they have been there and they create the conditions of possibility or impossibility for different kinds of institutions. It's no surprise that war was the main condition of possibility in 1810 in the Prussia as it was for the Morrill Act in 1862, right? Um, I think that is important. And, 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 you know, we are also living in a moment of crisis, pandemic, you know, dual pandemics, et cetera, that could have a similar kind of effect. But I think that what's important, and maybe this is the prescriptive or normative part of my at least historical lesson, is that, um, is that we not think that, um, have a defeatist understanding of the university as simply reflecting its time period, but that individuals were, were the most important source um, of, of, or levers, or you could say pulling different levers of change over time. And so, so you know, from, from William, Wilhelm von Humboldt up through Clark Kerr, including Daniel Coit Gilman and many others, W.E.B. Du Bois, you have, you know, exceptionally talented individuals who are able to speak different constituents and bring people together under a, uh, under a single tent to create new iterations of these institutions. And, and I think that if we see this sort of, you know, ourselves as educators, as, you know, you are all more, insti more institutional leaders than I, as, as sort of as agents rather than objects of this change, then we can, I think there's a way to see the, the, the different formulations in the past as empowering rather than defeating. I mean, that's that's kind of my, <laughs> that's sort of the positive, I think, view of this, is that we well, can I create think, new combinations, you know. I, I think this hopeful note, uh, con as we confront the the myriad <laughs> choices that we will have in the university in the in the couple of years that are in front of us uh, might be a good place to end. I, we could go on talking about this for hours and I would love it, uh, but I want to recognize the finitude of uh, people's uh, engagement with this broad site of the syllabus. And I wanted to thank you both immensely, not only for this conversation, but for the underlying work that makes it possible. And I think you've both contributed enormously to our self-understanding of what it means to have a university and how it got the way it is configured today. Thank May you. I Thank you.